I think it's time. It's time to get started. I'm Janice Robinson. I'm the moderator for this session. This session is called Born Analog, a university library joins the digital age through private-public partnership. And our presenters are Troy Espy, Melissa Bailey, and Austin McLean from uh, ProQuest. So this is just a reminder to all of you who have entered this session to make sure that you keep your video and microphone off until we get to a point where you might want to ask a question. But you can also type your questions in the Q&A, and the presenters can see those, and I can help make sure that if they don't get them answered, that I'll help them you know, ask the question. So take it away, Melissa, Austin, and Troy. OK, well, great. Well, my name is Troy Espy, and I'm a librarian at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. Um, and joining me are Melissa Bailey, who is a cataloging assistant, also from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, and Austin McLean, Senior Director of Academic Relations at ProQuest. And like Janice said, this is our presentation, Born Analog, a university library joins the digital age through a public-private partnership. Melissa, take it away. All right, so I have been working um, at UWSP with the thesis, theses for close to nine years, um, and we've always been real paper pushers. Um, when I first started um, helping out with the thesis um, finding, um, we required everybody to um, submit a paper and an electronic thesis. Um, and they had to deliver each of those paper copies to us. If they wanted extra copies for themselves, they had to print out um, their own copy of each one they wanted to have bound. Um, and uh, they had to physically deliver it to us in the library. Um, along with that, we only accepted paper payments. Um, we didn't have a card reader, so you either had to pay with cash or check. Um, <clears throat> and we also had a lot of paper forms to fill out. Um, there were agreement forms and there was a form we had to fill out and return to the department um, to confirm that the student had uh, completed their um, requirement for graduation. Um, and we also had to do a lot of shipping. So we physically had to ship every item that we got in so that increased our paper trail with shipping lists and additional bindery slips. So we first considered digital submissions in 2017. Uh, that's when the Doctor of Education and Sustainability launched at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. Now, this was the second doctoral program on campus, but it would be the first to require a dissertation for graduation. And I just kind of love this uh, photograph. They're all holding up flat Stevie. Stevie Pointer mm -hmm. is, is our mascot. So to make doctoral students do something that silly, I thought was fun to share. Uh, next, next slide there, Melissa. <laughs> Okay, more about the ED program. So the ED in sustainability was an online program with students uh, spread across the country, and there's even an international uh, student or two in that program. So we knew that paper submissions uh, for dissertations was going to pose uh, some challenges. And then it wasn't long after the ED program started in 2017 that their faculty uh, began asking about submitting dissertations to ProQuest ETD administrator. Uh, the faculty argued, uh, and, and Austin is going to tell you much more about ProQuest ETD, ETD administrator at the end of this presentation. So the ED faculty, uh, they argued that inclusion in ProQuest would increase discoverability of students' dissertation, and then it also carried a degree of prestige. I mean, I think the ProQuest uh, definitely is the gold standard of thesis and dissertation databases. And those were all valid arguments. Next slide. Uh, but I was having none of it. Uh, there was no way that I was going to put our students' dissertations behind a paywall of a private for-profit company. None. I just wasn't going to do it. I'm a librarian. I'm all about open access. 
Plus, our library, we don't even subscribe to ProQuest dissertations and theses database. So does that mean our, our own patrons uh, wouldn't be able to access the dissertations of our own students? Well, spoiler alert, I eventually changed my mind, but please let me, let me explain why here. Next slide, Melissa. Okay, so sometime after this EdD program launched on our campus, the UWSP libraries made a decision and it was kind of a big decision. Uh, we decided that we were going to upload all of our theses into our institutional repository, which is called Minds at UW. So we're talking more than a thousand theses dating back to the early 1970s. And we did it, they're all in there. It took over a year to get them all in there with all the metadata and such. But now you can freely access and download all of our dissertations and all of our theses from anywhere in the world with an internet connection. We also made another decision that any future theses or dissertations also would be uploaded to Minds at UW. So this would, pr this would ensure preservation and open access and never one of those pesky paywalls. And you're gonna see why this was an important decision in just a little bit. All right, go ahead, Melissa. So let's fast forward to 2020, the year 2020. Our acquisitions manager, Ann Swenson, Swenson, announced her retirement. Now, Ann was the one who had handled paper theses for more than three decades. And uh, from Melissa's slide, you understand how much work that involved. Uh, and this probably won't surprise you either. The library wasn't going to replace Ann. Thesis processing would be absorbed by the staff, and when I say staff, I really mean Melissa. All right, next one. Okay, also in 2020, uh, as you'll remember, an uninvited guest visited campus. Melissa, next slide. Yeah, like with everything else in the world, the pandemic really wreaked havoc on the library and on thesis submissions. So the library closed, students were sent home, and then for theses and dissertations, the library, we actually suspended paper submissions. So instead of paper submissions, we asked students to send us an electronic version of their thesis or their dissertation, and then we, the library, would print copies for them, and that was all on the library's dime. We absorbed that cost for the students. However, students still had to pay if they wanted bound copies of their thesis or dissertation. And this really turned into a logistical fiasco. You try convincing a millennial to mail a paper check to the library and good luck with that. In fact, we still have a box of unpaid dissertations in the library basement. Next slide. Finally, we decided to take the plunge. Next slide. In June 2020, we created a portal in ProQuest ETD Administrator for students to submit to ProQuest dissertations and theses database. And despite my initial reluctance, setup was quick and easy and support was fantastic. Next slide. So at first, submission to ProQuest ETD was optional. Students still had to submit paper copies of their theses and dissertations to graduate. Okay, the portal was more or less just a convenience for students who wanted to include their thesis or dissertation in the ProQuest database. Discoveries, prestige, all that. Now, students uh, still could buy cheap bound copies of their thesis or dissertation from the library. They didn't have to buy from ProQuest if they didn't want to. Uh, for students who submitted to ProQuest, the, the process include an institutional repository agreement form. Uh, next slide, Melissa. So with one click, uh, while students are submitting their thesis or dissertations to ProQuest ETD, students could agree to upload their thesis or dissertation to Minds at UW Institutional Repository. And for me, this was really the clincher. It ensured that our students' research would remain open access forevermore with no paywalls. Next slide. And as promised, EdD students started submitting their dissertations to ProQuest. In fact, the library received the first dissertation in the university's 126 year history. Next slide. 
So we pulled the plug on paper submissions in January 2021. Now all theses and dissertations must be submitted online to ProQuest ETD if students want to graduate. There, now I, I kind of want to explain this next part here. There is no upfront cost to students, okay? That is if they just want to submit their thesis and dissertation and be done with it, that's free, okay? However, students must pay if they want any bound copies for themselves, okay? And ProQuest also offers extra services that cost money as well, okay? So it's not completely free. It's free just to submit. If that's all you want to do, that's free, but you definitely can buy extras. And full transparency, most of our students do end up buying bound copies from ProQuest along with extra services such as copyright protection. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, whenever a student submits a thesis or dissertation, uh, ProQuest automatically sends a copy, a bound auto automatically sends a library a bound copy, which we then add to our permanent print collection here in the building. Now, the library pays for that bound copy, not the student. Okay, so that's kind of the end of it. And Melissa now will explain the process in much more detail. Yeah, so the process has been much simplified. Um, so on the student side, um, they just have to go in and they create their login and they submit their PDF to the ETD site. Um, and then all the information that we had on our agreement forms and any additional information we needed for cataloging was already in what they had to fill out um, on the site. Um, then if they wanted their own extra copies, they could enter their payment information right there. And then after that, all they have to do is um, wait for their confirmation email and then their personal bound copies would be sent right to them. And then on the staff side, um, I receive um, an email that somebody has submitted their thesis or dissertation. Um, I check to make sure everything's complete. Um, mostly that's checking that they have their signed warrant page in there. That's usually the one um, the one thing that holds things up. Um, and I can um, insert that in there if, if needed. And then all I have to do after that is accept the submission on the ETD website. Um, and then I can download the PDF from there to upload to our institutional repository, Minds at UW. Um, I send out a confirmation email to the student and their department and their advisor. And then I just have to sit back and wait for the library copy to be delivered. Um, and there are many benefits to um, switching to this. Um, with the online submission form, it moves a lot more smoothly than it did when we had all these paper copies. Um, <clears throat> the students don't even have to leave their home to come and submit their thesis. Um, they don't have to print off like five copies of their sometimes very long thesis um, and then bring that to campus. Um, they don't have to worry about bringing cash or a check to pay. Um, that was one of our big questions was how do we pay? And most people wanted to pay with a card. We would have to send them to the ATM, which is actually no longer in our building. Um, and we actually got rid of our cash register so that um, that was one of the things that was holding us up with being able to get rid of that. Um, and then with the binding, um, we don't have to make shipping lists or fill out the bindery slips. Um, we just have to press a button and then wait for it to come. Um, another thing that um, cost us a lot of time was having to um, contact the students or their advisor when their copies came back to us and um, trying to coordinate a pickup or directly mailing their um, thesis back to them. Um, most people have left the area, left the state, a few even leaving the country, and we would have carts full of bound theses and that nobody had come to pick up. And then of course, there's the added benefit of the added open access um, there's more readers, more, more citations, more recognition, and, and their works have, are able to have a greater impact. I think that's it on our end. 
Great. Yes. Hi, I'm Austin. I'll be happy to talk a little bit about ETD Administrator for those of you who don't know uh, what it is and are maybe interested in trying it. So next slide, please. So the ETD Administrator is a free uh, and easy way to manage the workflow. Uh, the process is in the middle of the slide there where a student submits their ETDs. It's then reviewed as Melissa talked about. Uh, and some universities do a very thorough review that includes format, uh, going through the PDF in a lot of detail. Other universities do more of a cursory review, but after the review occurs, uh, there's communication that can happen with the student. For example, if the student didn't follow the format guidelines, you see those up and down thumbs represent the ability for the university to ask the student for changes. And then the student can resubmit their ETD and the uh, graduate school or the library can take a look at the formatting. And if it, makes, uh, it meets all the guidelines, the, the uh, university can deliver the ETD and that delivery happens at the same time it's sent to ProQuest and sent to the IR or to the library to load into the IR. We have a direct uh, in integration or it can be a mediated integration from the university perspective. And then, this, then the, fin the finished uh, ETD is presented in ProQuest and in the IR. So next slide, please. So there's quite a few university benefits. Uh, if you're thinking of having an ETD submission system and using the ETD administrator, and we have a lot of new features. The ETD administrator has been in existence for over 15 years, but one of the new newer things we've implemented is this committee review feature, which you can see on the screen there. A lot of times the university would like to have a committee member, or maybe it's the advisor, ensure that the PDF the student uploaded is the correct and final PDF. So we have a process that we can implement an ETD administrator for that to happen as well. Um, we can accept uh, lots of different file types. We're very flexible. It can be PDFs, video, audio files, data sets, et cetera. And we also have a new single sign-on feature that works with Shibboleth to allow students and administrator to use their university logins to act Access the ETD system. So it's quite a straightforward and simple process there. Uh, we heard Melissa and, and Troy talk about the university copies that are available for students and for the university if a bound copy is of interest. And we have this responsive uh, customer service team. I was really glad to hear, Troy, that that's been uh, something that's worked out for you to have that team be very responsive. So that's good to hear. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of benefits for the authors as well, and I thought I'd go into this a little bit in more detail since Melissa and Troy didn't talk about it in too much uh, detail. And I, I don't want to repeat things that they've said, which was a lot about the system, but this is the author benefit. So the, the author benefits by a securely hosted content uh, at ProQuest with the dissertation and thesis as well, as I'm sure um, well, Wisconsin has great security for the dissertations in your IR and the theses there as well. It's important and we always point out that the authors retain copyright. ProQuest Dissertations is not one of those uh, publishers where the we, we have to take the copyright from the author. The author has the copyright and ProQuest is a non-exclusive distributor of that dissertation and thesis. So that means that the author can do many, many things with that work that, that they um, maybe interested in doing down the road, hosting it on their own website or turning it into a, a print monograph or a chapter as was talked about in the plenary session earlier, that's very much possible uh, through ETD Administrator. We're happy to also offer uh, customized embargoes uh, for the university. The university can dictate what type of embargoes are offered to the student for their institutional repository. We also pay the author a royalty, so the author earns 10% if we ever sell a copy of it, you know, in, in a bound format, for example, or in microfilm, we're still selling microfilm, or in a PDF format, the author gets 10% royalty payment to them on an annual basis. Um, and we have those services that I think Troy touched on, the copyright registration, which is an optional service, and an open access service that is also optional through ProQuest as well. A lot of schools are generating an ORCID for the student. So that's a way, an ORCID ID is a kind of an identifier, a numeric identifier to track the student through their life cycle. If they go into the academy or if they go into a corporate setting, you'll be able to have that ORCID ID and follow that student. Uh, the, uh, you know, the alumni 
departments love that ability to follow the student's kind of uh, career after they graduate. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're trying to do at, at ProQuest is really amplify what's occurring at the institutional repository. The institutional repository we know has thousands of, of viewers and readers. Each university has their institutional repository typically. And so what ProQuest does is it takes it to an even wider audience and amplifies what happens in that repository. So we, we put it in four different uh, uh, streams essentially in the ProQuest platform, which is the ProQuest Dissertation and Thesis Global Database, or what we call PQDT Global. That has over 4 million researchers that are using it uh, on, uh, throughout the year. 3,000 universities subscribe to the PQDT Global Database, and it has a, an audience there. We also partner with Google Scholar. So we've made a partnership with Google Scholar that ensures that the, the ETD is visible through a Google Scholar search. So that's another way that we're amplifying the visibility. We also uh, increase readership and viewership through subject indexes. And what we mean by a subject index or a disciplinary index are things like Compendix and PsycInfo and InSpec and MLA. We know that a lot of faculty in particular are really focusing on their disciplinary index. So if they're a psychologist, for example, they'll, they'll use PsycInfo almost exclusively to do a lot of their research. And so ProQuest puts, in the case of PsycInfo, all the psychology dissertations and theses, uh, making them available to PsycInfo to then add visibility as users are using those disciplinary indexes. Uh, we also support your IR by providing enhanced metadata, providing the copy of the ETD through ETD Administrator to your IR, and making sure that the users have a quality metadata experience when they're accessing the work in the local repository. Okay, next slide, please. So we put uh, on the screen here just a few examples of the universities that are accessing your theses if you're working with a ProQuest ETD administrator, and these are universities around the world, uh, uh, and uh, these are some of the more prominent universities that have access to the PQDT Global and are doing extensive research on your ETDs. Next slide, please. So finally, one of the newest things that we have, and we encourage anyone that is submitting their dissertations and theses to ProQuest and contributing to PQDT to take advantage of the free ETD dashboard, which shows your university's dissertations and theses and how they're being accessed through those 3,000 universities that use PQDT Global. You can see some really interesting statistics. What are your best sellers, your most downloaded works? for universities around the world? What are your most downloaded subject areas by other universities who are accessing your ETDs? And what universities in specific terms are accessing your ETDs? You may find it's a university around the block that is accessing your ETDs the most, or it could be a university around the world that is looking at your ETDs the most. It's a really intriguing way to think about potential collaboration with these universities, because since they're accessing your ETDs, so uh, so much, you must have common um, um, courses or uh, doctoral programs or master's programs or subject areas. And, and that's a good way to open a dialogue potentially with these universities that are using your ETD so extensively. So if you don't have your ETD dashboard access set up, we invite anybody uh, and at USETDA to have uh, to contact ProQuest and we'll set up your account. Your account probably is already being used by others at your university, but each person has their own login and we'd be happy to set up a login with you. So you can chat me privately or, or anybody at ProQuest and we'll be sure to, access, to set up access for your ETD dashboard site yourself. Great. So now I think I'll turn it back over to Troy and Melissa and to Janice for the Q&A session. Um, I do have one question I'd like you, and I posted it here. Can you write, remind all of us that, so now there's an ETD, a thesis or dissertation in ProQuest. So if somebody finds that in ProQuest, can they view the whole document or are they only viewing the abstract or the first page and then have to pay to view anymore? Can you clarify that? It's sort of changed over the years, I think. 
I can take it. Oh, yes, right, Jen. <laughs> You're right. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, you go ahead. I was going to take a stab at it, but I want you to to, to correct me, uh, Austin. So is, the way I understand it, if they find uh, UW Stevens Point uh, thesis or dissertation in ProQuest, <clears throat> they will not be able to access it from ProQuest right then and there because we do not subscribe uh, to that uh, to that database. Um, but uh, again, the the pr uh, dissertation or the thesis would be in our institutional repository, and then it, it's also in Google Scholar uh, or in Google. So uh, if the uh, researcher would just Google the title of the thesis, they would find a free uh, PDF. But if they wanted to uh, access it right then and there from ProQuest, they would hit a paywall unless the student paid for uh, the online access option in, in ProQuest or if their library uh, happens to subscribe to that database. Is that accurate, Austin? I don't want to completely slander you. Yeah, I try <laughs> okay. to do a really good job. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it really depends, on, as Troy is saying, on the library library subscription. So if the library has subscribed they'll, and you click on the link, you'll be passed right through to the PDF. If you're, uh, if you're on Google uh, and you click on the link, it'll say, oh, does, does your library subscribe, you know, or log in through your library. And so that's a good kind of prompt to a student or a researcher to log into their library and see um, if, if they do subscribe to uh, the PQDT database, if they're not sure themselves. Or obviously you can do what Troy suggested and go find the dissertation or thesis through another avenue. So all of those are, are great paths and there's, it's wonderful that there's lots of different discovery um, paths for the ETD. And Janice, we also put a, a link to the free PDF in our library catalog uh, as well. So did that, did that answer your question? Yes, I think so. I just think that's great to know that if someone discovers it in ProQuest that they, they have an avenue where they don't have to pay for it, even though there's so many great services with showing up in ProQuest and the ease of getting it out there. We don't want people to feel like they can't really find it and read the whole thing. So thanks for clarifying that. Yes, yes. And ProQuest does have our own open access publishing uh, option for an author that that is $95 as the author uses the ETD administrator if they want to publish open access through ProQuest and publish open access through their IR and uh, that they want they're able to pay that $95 free ProQuest makes it available on our uh, ProQuest.com website. So anybody with an internet connection can find it through ProQuest or through the IR using our open access uh, model. Do you have any statistics about uh, how many people are actually selecting that option, paying for open access, open access in ProQuest versus just uploading it because they're required to for their school? Yes, we do. It's, it's a low number. It's all about 5%, 5 or 6 percent that do the ProQuest open access publishing model. And what, what we initially did that because there were a lot of universities that didn't have an institutional repository. You know, this was 10 years or so ago, and so they wanted that option. And yet even today, when, that when universities do have an institutional repository, students pay that $95 because they say, oh, I really want the widest possible visibility and I'll do it through my IR and do it through ProQuest as well. So it's very much kind of an individual decision. Um, that uh, authors make. Yeah, Janice, to my knowledge on our campus, we've only had one student who has opted for that. And I kind of advise students not to do that because as long as they, uh, you know, click the one button on the IR agreement form, you know, it will be open access in Minds at UW. Okay. Have you noticed that, Melissa? Any other uh, students uh, doing the open access option in, in ProQuest? No, I don't. I haven't noticed. I, I know there was that one, um, but that was about it. Um, I do have one other question. Oh, uh, Austin, will you just post either in the chat um, where we would go to start uh, creating a login or asking for a login to the ETD dashboard? I know it's been a around for a while, but I haven't used it and I have a new dean and I think there are others here who probably, you know, we haven't published that that's available. And that was a great reminder to me that we ought to all go take a look at it, you know? 
share the education. Absolutely, I'll post that right now. I'll give you, I'll post the, the email address to our customer service team that will be able to set you up with access to that. Great. Hopefully that'll be helpful to all of us. Are there any other questions by anybody in the room? Feel free to uh, turn on your video and mic and ask your question. I didn't see anybody. <laughs> I know um, we started with ETD administrator a long time ago. Um, and then our, our publishing, our binderies in the, in the state, wherever we were sending them, they sort of said, we're not gonna be in this business anymore. We're not making money. And we've always asked our doctoral students to submit to ProQuest, but we had our own internal submission system and they always got confused. They would go to ProQuest and think they were done and we'd like, nope, you have to do internal too. So a couple of years ago, we started, the, or last year, we started the harvesting option. And this, so ProQuest comes and harvests all of our theses and dissertations and they're now discoverable in ProQuest. And we don't have to require our doctoral students to submit to ProQuest anymore because they're gonna end up there anyway, which you know, years ago we, we made a gentleman's agreement that we would share our doctoral research with, with the world through ProQuest. Or what, what, what was your name? How many years ago, Austin, UMI? Uh, that well, we might have been UMI. Yes, that was quite a few years ago. But but it's great, Janice, to know that you, the switch uh, to harvesting has worked out so well, and we're very happy to have all those master's theses to provide that added amplification and visibility. It's made it so to smooth for us, and our students only have one place they have to upload, and we love that part. Great, great. And I think that's a good good thing to point out. You know, we we have multiple ways to be, come into the ProQuest stream, ETD administrator, harvesting. So we really try to make it uh, uh, such that if you want to work with ProQuest, we have a, an easy way for you to do so. Yeah, Janice, we ran into a similar situation where our library was actually in Ohio uh, was uh, threatening to close. So that was another um, you know, circumstance that I think I'm going to uh, online uh, submissions. Um, so we would charge uh, that binary. Uh, oh, uh, Troy, binary. Oh, I'm sorry. your mic is something, it's kind of choppy. We couldn't oh, quite sorry. understand can that. Can you hear me better now? It's still a little bit choppy. Okay, okay, I'll mute it just a minute. Yeah, I had a hard time uh, translating that. Anybody else? Uh, no? Okay. It's, it's, it's still choppy. Maybe type your, type your comments in the chat. Luckily, the gremlins didn't enter until after you did the presentation, which is a, a very good thing. Right, right. But um, I mean, maybe you could type your comments in the chat, Troy. We have about five, five, six more minutes. Whatever you were trying to tell us, you can put in the chat. We can read it there or in the Q&A, either one. And maybe maybe I can ask a question of Melissa uh, about the ETD process that she went through the process pretty uh, pretty in much in detail. Has your ETD uh, you know, review changed much when you did the change from paper to electronic in terms of what you do uh, within the ETD administrator? Uh, no, I think it's, it's pretty much the same as um, what we were doing before, um, it, I think it makes it a lot easier um, in that area because the biggest thing was we would get um, the thesis but not the signed warrant page and it's, it works very easy, just ask for an email with the 
PDF and I can slip it in there and I can upload it right away. So that's that's been great. So your university, all of the approvals come through just the department and the committee and does your graduate office or your library do any formatting review or send them back for revisions? I, we just kind of um, assume that if it's gone through the review process with their department and, and all that stuff that um, it should be ready to go. Um, we don't, the library itself doesn't require much in formatting. Um, that's another one of the big questions that we got, but as long as we have a PDF that can be printed and bound, that was really all that we required, that and the signed warrant page. And when you say a signed warrant page, so this has an actual signature on it, a paper um, form is scanned or? Um, we Right now, we're, I think we're doing a lot of um, getting it signed through DocuSign so that you can tra transmit it through the email. Um, but before we had to have the, the, we had physical signatures on there from the, the committee, yeah. And is that part of the ETD that you upload or is it just allows you to upload it? Um, I think the student can um, <clears throat> upload that along, they can upload it along with the PDF. We like to have it in the PDF that gets bound. Um, so I usually have to just edit the PDF and slip it in there. but. Both of those will show up in the submission. Yeah, and we talked about in the in the, our preparation call. I think you know, making sure that they're not live signatures in the copy that goes to ProQuest, since we you know really discourage signatures. And I know you are going to go back with Troy and talk about that to me to try to make sure that they're not live signatures in ProQuest because of identity theft or things of that nature. I don't. Do you have? Have you had talked any or thought any more about that since we talked? Okay. Well, well we definitely I, don't want signatures, so please, <laughs> please don't send yeah. them to us. And we'll, we'll, people we'll are too savvy you. these days. Take your signature and plop it in somewhere. So avoid that. But um, I do want to commend you guys for doing this quickly during the pandemic. You know, sort of resolving and doing something that was actually really helpful to everyone on your campus. And I think you made a good choice going with ProQuest. I've used that ETD administrator for many years. And, you know, when we build our own in-house ETD approval system, I wanted some of those same functionality. So um, I think that's, you know, you've done a great job. So kudos to you guys.